Chapter 201 Greetings to our fourth champion, shouted Bagman to the entire corral in the stands, amplifying his voice with sonorous. Maximilian Knight. However, as before, the greetings were sluggish, and their enthusiasm waned considerably as students and guests saw the threat the champions faced and the risks they were taking. One mistake was tantamount to death or serious injury. A young blonde boy, looking no younger than the other champions, walked into the corral. He was wearing a rather stylish three-piece suit with a sparse, almost invisible stripe and a black overcoat on top, to the surprise of many. If Potter and Crumb were in their Quidditch uniforms and Fleur was in a tracksuit, then these clothes were more in keeping with a business meeting than a tournament competition. A meeting with a dragon. Are you worried? Lavender Brown turned to the roommate sitting next to her, Hermione. A silly question, for they were both very worried, clutching the edges of their robes. Except Hermione's face was deathly pale, but expressed no emotion. Yes, the girl answered briefly. On the other hand, Lavender couldn't help but notice Max's resemblance to one of the guests who had come to the tournament. He looked a lot like Narcissa Malfoy, and there was no doubt in her mind that it was the mother of their classmate, Draco Malfoy, who sat among the other adult and influential wizards. Thinking about the reasons for this resemblance distracted the girl from her worries, and she almost missed the moment when Max suddenly ran at the dragon, pulling his wand from his sleeve. Wow! Dear audience, what's he doing? shouted Bagman, and everyone suddenly held their breath. This was something no one had expected. The Horntail didn't think of anything special, and simply exhaled a previously unseen jet of flame into which Max literally flew. Oh, everyone sighed anxiously in various ways. Only a few noticed that just before he came into contact with, with the fire, Max seemed to be sucked into an apparition vortex or something like that. He apparated, exclaimed Bagman disbelievingly. But dear spectators, where and how? We're still under the dome of Hogwarts' anti-apparition charms. However, only Dumbledore, Delphine, in the form of a cat, and another old healer noticed that this was not an apparition vortex, but a twisting of matter characteristic of transfiguration. The jet of flame from the dragon's mouth suddenly stopped, and it was like a pinch of pepper hit the dragon in the nose, and the huge monster shook its head. Not a moment later, it was as if the dragon had gone mad. The dragon lunged sharply to the side, jerking its wings and head convulsively once more. As if trying to scratch its head, the dragon swept it across the ground several times, but clearly it was only getting worse. The dragon violently slammed its head to the ground, smashing boulders and raising clouds of crumbs and dust into the air, jerked sharply, and tore off the chain it was chained to the arena. But it couldn't take off and only tried a couple more times to get rid of the discomfort. The spectators were as shocked as the draconologists. Nothing was clear yet, and they were not given the go-ahead to act. The raised cloud of dust practically made it difficult to see only the silhouette of the horn tail. After a couple of moments, a tenacious eye would have noticed the tip of a small sword suddenly emerging from the dragon's nape, but there were none of those. However, it was at this moment that the dragon fell to the ground, as if knocked down. Its tongue fell out of its open mouth, and a stream of blood immediately gushed out. Due to the thick dust suspension, no one noticed a tiny bird, literally a couple of centimeters, that escaped from the dragon's mouth and flew to the place where Max was standing. The spectators once again saw a vortex, so similar to an apparition, which instantly transformed into the guy, Max Knight, recently lost from sight. There was no sign of fire or any other damage on him. The goo, he put his wand back in its sheath in his sleeve and walked briskly to the nest, where he picked up a golden egg. Unbelievable, yelled Bagman, and the audience from the stands literally exploded with applause. I can't tell you what just happened, but the result is incredible. To the unceasing thunder of applause, Max left the corral. The judges argued, the judges were outraged, but among them, Dumbledore sat calmly and with a slight smile. What is the mighty old wizard happy about? Dumbledore saw the powerful transfiguration performed by the fourth year. Dumbledore is pleased. And as for killing the dragon, the old headmaster loves a good beefsteak and is well aware that meat does not grow on trees. Chapter 202 Crew 
As soon as I left the corral, I was greeted immediately by McGonagall, whose face was a clear mix of joy and confusion. The reason was obvious. I'd won, but I'd killed a dragon. I have no doubt she would have slain the lizard herself if necessary, but nowhere does it say you have to kill a dragon during the task. Congratulations, Mr. Knight. Still joy for my success overcame the rest of her doubts. The fastest pass, by far, less than a minute. But I don't think the judges will appreciate the collateral damage. I was only following the conditions. It seemed to be to get hold of the egg as quickly as possible, and there wasn't a word about anything else. Absolutely. Go to that tent over there. The professor nodded toward the one next to the champion tent. That's where our healer will examine you. Nodding, I quickly made my way to the tent. Inside was the most authentic camping version of our hospital wing. Rows of simple iron beds with screens, and Potter was sitting on one of them with a bandaged arm. A little farther away, next to the nook for various potions and medicines, Fleur sat hugging an egg, glancing sideways at the burnt edge of her sweatpants, where you could now clearly see the girl's chiseled leg. For a brief moment, the feeling of boiled chicken was recalled. Just think of it. Madame Pomfrey emerged from her cubbyhole in her unchanging burgundy and white uniform. Bring on the dragons. The healer quickly approached and with a couple of passes of her wand performed a diagnostic. You're perfectly fine, Mr. Knight. She nodded happily and then turned immediately to Harry, who had stirred. Unlike you, Potter, either you will obey my recommendations or I will have to apply emergency treatment measures. All right, I got it. I'm sitting down, the boy replied with a mischievous smile, but he stopped creeping toward his freedom. Hermione stepped into the tent with a confident stride and just as confidently reached me, immediately hugging me. Dragons, she spoke softly, almost in my ear as she continued to hug me. I can't believe it. Dragons. Come on, I stroked the girl on the back. Just dragons. Well, yes, just, Hermione pulled away. Still pale, obvious concern in her eyes, though not a single emotion on her face. If you only knew how scared I was when I found out the nature of the task. It wasn't that hard. Indistinct sounds of outrage echoed from the rest of the champions, especially from Potter. Of course, Hermione nodded. It's not hard to kill. It's hard to accomplish the task without killing. You'll probably get your points reduced because of it. Then another member of the action showed up, Ron Weasley. Looking at me with both consternation and dislike at the same time, the redhead headed toward Potter. At the sight of his former friend, the redhead was visibly embarrassed, but he spoke seriously. Harry, whoever put your name in the cup, I get it, he wants to kill you. Figured it out at last, replied Potter equally seriously. It took you a long time to figure it out. We watched this drama in silence, and Ron tried to find words but couldn't. Normally, I couldn't keep my mouth shut. In such situations, it's customary to apologize for the inconvenience caused. Oh, fuck you, the redhead said. Son of Death Eaters, Dumbledore will show you yet. Even the foreign guests didn't hold back a chuckle, but there was some shouting and commotion outside, and a chunky red-headed guy in his twenties literally flew into the tent. You, the guy flew over to me, roughly pushing aside Hermione, who was standing nearby and grabbed me by the chest. He was of England's average height, a little shorter than me. Bastard! Charlie! exclaimed Ron in surprise. This same Charlie, apparently a Weasley, swung for a punch. At this moment, two more guys burst into the tent, although the second, fair-haired, would be more suitable for the word man. They were all rather stocky, and I could see that their work was dangerous. There were burn marks and minor injuries to their hands, including blisters. I caught a glimpse of all of this as Charlie swung around. I leaned forward and ran my forehead over Charlie's nose, crushing his face and throwing him off me. The two wizards who had run in raised their wands, but then Hermione found a method to relieve stress, and both wizards, under the influence of a powerful spell, with the verbal formula, yeah, which was a disarming spell, flew out of the tent like corks out of a bottle. You killed it. Charlie looked at me angrily from the floor, wiping blood from his broken nose. There is no need to stir up drama. I grinned involuntarily, but I didn't have time to continue. Ron flew toward me, ready to punch me. Don't touch my broth. A right kick from the body sent Ron lying down with his brother, but unlike Charlie, 
Ron passed out. There is no need to stir up drama, I began my speech again. The Romanian dragon sanctuary is famous for the quality of its dragon ingredients, and the age is also indicated. I squatted over the two lying brothers. Your hypocrisy is as vile as a decomposing corpse, I quietly, literally spat into Weasley's face. What are you accusing me of? That I killed the dragon too soon, and she could have hatched a few clutches of eggs? Charlie was lost. Literally. He clearly didn't know what to say in such a case. How many have you killed personally, or helped kill your colleagues? Why is the butcher of a regular slaughterhouse rebuking me for killing an animal? What's going on here? Popped Madame Pomfrey out of her nook, immediately rushing to the aid of the victims. Mr. Knight. Self-defense, I summarized briefly, getting up and heading for the exit. Abruptly, without a swing, but with all my might, I kicked Charlie in the head. The distinctive crunch of his jaw and its obvious deformity, along with the blood splatter and teeth flying out, hinted at severe fractures, and this is for a disrespectful attitude towards a girl. Mr. Knight, don't you dare beat the wounded in front of me, outraged Madame Pomfrey, waving her wand over Ron. However, at the same time, she was in no hurry to help Charlie. I nodded to our healer, and we left the tent with Hermione, heading back to the corral. The scores should be announced soon, though I didn't really care about them. Chapter 203, the process of announcing scores has never interested me. More important, I think, was the fact that Hermione didn't let go of my hand. In the end, while the scores were being announced, I wondered about the results of the first task. For starters, I was able to absorb the dragon's soul. Or rather, I was able to do so with a sword. What did it give me? I have no idea. Second, I checked the work of transfiguration into a golem-like creature of various materials. The dragon flames could not damage the alloys due to insufficient temperature, and the magic component was safely blocked by Protego. Among other things, the low practical value of such skills against wizards became clear to me, at least in the hands of ordinary users, so to speak. A powerful Fenita is capable of undoing transfiguration. That's undeniable. The range of wandless spells is extremely small for the average wizard, and that means a lot. Transfiguring yourself into some kind of combat form has a number of vulnerabilities against wizards. You might get transfigured back, get pelted with all sorts of spells, and so on. The transfiguration into a form different in size and weight from the wizard's body dramatically increases the amount of magic you consume, which means that not everyone can do it which means you need to process the spell into a ritual, and performing the ritual takes time. A lot of time. In general, even though Delphine got a master combatant with a similar project, such spells or ritual schemes are not widespread due to their narrow range of use, specifically against weak wizards, golems, or magical creatures. Well, or muggles with their techniques. Max, Hermione literally pulled me out of my thoughts by pulling my hand slightly. Oh, funny boy. Rowena's voice echoed in my head with a kind of doom. I may not have personal experience, but based on your own knowledge and observations, I can say with certainty that something must already be done about it. About it. Yeah? Score, Max. Even though I was distracted from thinking about it, I was still following what was going on with the edge of my mind. I appreciated Hermione's reluctance to leave me, despite the fact that only champions and school representatives, such as headmasters from Hogwarts, or some responsible person from Charmbatten and Durmstrang, were invited to the announcement of scores. And what's there? That leaves Fleur Delacour, Hermione whispered. You, by the results, share first place with Harry. That one worked pretty clean, flying his broom and distracting the dragon. He got a little stoned when the dragon kicked the cobblestones nearby. Crumb very accurately hit the dragon with some combat spell in the eye, similar to a blinding curse with a flesh curse and physical destruction of the eye bed. I read something like that. True, the dragon went berserk and crushed almost all the real eggs. He got his scores cut tangibly for that. Though Hermione spoke in a whisper, the champion standing next to her could hear her clearly. Fleur made a gross mistake when she put the dragon to sleep. It almost cost her her life. Ah, here. Hermione shook her head in the direction of the scores the judges were magically visualizing. Fleur did indeed receive the lowest score, though the difference between champions was minimal, 
extremely insignificant. Each of the judges, in one way or another, lowered the scores of someone. For me, for example, Madame Maxim slightly lowered the score and greatly lowered Karkaroff. Krum's score was lowered by Bagman because if I killed one dragon, then Krum, five, because eggs, eggs. Dumbledore didn't seem any saddened by the death of the Horntail, though he gave me a nine, despite the brilliant execution of the spell and the quick execution of the task. I bet it was for the kill since it was entirely optional. After the scores were awarded, we champions were asked to enter our tent. Now it was clearly easier to be here. There is no that atmosphere of painful expectation. Already relieved, Crumb, Fleur, and Harry were stick, anding, or sitting on the bench, hugging their eggs. Well done, all of you. A happy Ludo Bagman stormed into the tent, almost glaring. I want to briefly outline the future plans. The second task is almost three months away. It will take place on February 24th at 9.30 in the morning. But in that time, you'll have a lot to think about. Look at the golden eggs in your hands. You see, they open. Here are the hinges. Inside the egg is the key to the second task. It will help you get ready. Is that clear? Are you sure? Then go get some rest. Chapter 204 I couldn't help but notice Ron and Hermione standing on opposite sides of the exit. As soon as Potter and I stepped out, we each picked up our friend, and in two different groups, we headed back to Hogwarts. The guests don't live in the castle, though, preferring the ship and the carriage, so that's where the remaining champions went. As soon as we left the edge, Rita Skeeter popped out of the trees like a jack-in-the-box, in another bright, shocking outfit of gaudy color. The first thing this shark of a pen smelled was Potter's blood, and immediately pestered the guys with questions. Emergency evacuation, I whispered quietly toward Hermione, who seemed embarrassed to take my hand. And a dozen minutes ago, she hadn't been able to tear herself away from me. What? Let's get out of here quickly, or do you want to talk to a reporter who's going to twist everything? Absolutely not. Hermione shook her head negatively, and we quickly cast a set of cloaking charms on each other. Here the girl took my hand, because we couldn't see each other, either. While the annoying lady was trying to get a word out of Potter and Weasley, we slipped past unnoticed and made our way easily to the castle where we dropped our charms at the entrance and went quietly to the Chamber of Secrets. There was no more class anyway. We decided to get into this room in a tried and tested way through the second entrance on the fifth floor. After a long descent downstairs, we were immediately greeted by Delphine, sitting on a chair near the tent in the middle of the room. It turned out very interesting, Max. She nodded to both of us with a smile, inviting us into the tent. Already inside, in the makeshift study hall, sitting at tables and satisfying a slight hunger with dishes prepared in advance, Hermione and I listened to Delphine's thoughts on the other champions and my performance. Lady Greengrass didn't say much, but still. Crumb, in her opinion, is a bit sick in the head, determined, very accurate, and quick-witted, doesn't shy away from some quite brutal spells and causes concern. Potter is useless as a wizard and has passed the task on the ability to fly, which in some cases is also a lot. In Delphine's opinion, Fleur is the most dangerous to me. Cunning, beautiful, clever. If I threw myself at every pretty skirt, it wouldn't be me anymore. Also true, nodded Delphine. Max, I think, Hermione, who had been staring at the golden egg the whole time, decided to talk, that it's time to open this thing already. That's true. Let's see, I took the egg in my hands and twisted it this way and that. The sharper end had loops and a lock in the form of a dragon's paw, and judging by the structure of the egg, it should open like a bud, with petals on the loops. I opened the egg with a slight movement, and the tent was filled with a high-pitched noise, crackling and rattling, as if on glass. Despite the wild discomfort of this cacophony of sounds, I tried to listen, catch the algorithms of its changes, and other things that I could then use to explain why I suddenly decided to put it in the water. Delphine also only slightly winced, and judging by the look, she tried to listen. On the other hand, Hermione immediately covered her ears with her hands and looked at us with a martyr's face. As soon as I closed the egg, the girl breathed a sigh of relief. Interesting, smiled Delphine. I never wondered what that might sound like. Disgusting. You know what it is, don't you? 
Of course I do, Max. But you know yourself, I can't so obviously suggest, and moreover, answer openly. Then I'll try to reason. The squeak is heterogeneous, constantly changing so it carries a meaning, perhaps an acoustic one. Let's try it this way. Taking out my wand, I pointed it at the egg. I'll open it. Hermione immediately covered her ears with her palms, and I put one of the magical domes for potions on the egg. There are a great many of them, but with this particular one, I increased the density of the air in's ID. The effect was quite entertaining. The air inside refracted the light a little differently, and at the edges of the dome, the light curved slightly, as if it were a drop of a different substance. As soon as I opened the egg, everyone immediately noticed a change in the tone of the sound, even if only slightly. It was still as nasty, but its configuration had changed, making it seem even more like it carried information. Closing the egg and canceling the spell, I voiced another thought. The change in the density of the medium had caused an uncharacteristic change in the sound. It even seemed to make sense to me. I think it's worth experimenting with other mediums. However, reasoning logically, what media do we have in direct access? Water and earth. Stone, but I don't think, replied Hermione. Water, then? I transfigured an empty mug into a barrel with a wave of my wand, filling it with water, using aguamenti. Let's check in the water. Hermione, I pointed my hand toward the egg. As the author of the water idea, you do the testing. No way, the girl smiled. In case you're wrong, in water, sound tra travels much faster, and the vibrations of the medium have a much more destructive effect. Recall the fact that acoustic shocks from depth bombs exist. You regenerate quickly, and we'll take care of you if anything, right? Hermione looked at a smiling Delphine, and upon receiving an affirmative nod, she pointed to my egg and barrel invitingly. Okay, I'll check it myself. Chapter 205 Taking the egg, I completely immersed it in the water in the barrel and opened it. There was no sound outside, but as soon as I dipped my head into the water, I immediately heard musical overflows and a woman's voice. Come seek us where our voices sound. We cannot sing above the ground. And while you're searching, ponder this. We've taken what you'll sorely miss. An hour long you'll have to look and to recover what we took. But past an hour, the prospect's black, too late, it's gone, it won't come back. Closing the egg, I popped my head out of the barrel, immediately drying my hair with a gesture. Well? Hermione fidgeted impatiently in her chair. Silently I took the cold metal egg out of the barrel and set it on the table. With a gesture of my wand, I used Skurgify to remove the water and cancel the transfiguration of the barrel back into the cup with Finita. After quoting what I heard, I glanced at Hermione. What do you think? The girl looked thoughtfully at me, at Delphine, at me again. It was clear enough that Lady Greengrass knew the point of the tasks. Her family had been involved in the organization, after all. The words about the ground and the voices are not accidental, and given that the egg works in water, the hint is obvious. Hermione nodded to herself, folding her arms across her chest. Or should I say, under her breast? Let's say. Given that Black Lake is the only body of water on Hogwarts property, the second task will be held there. Something will be hidden there. The question is what and where. Where is not the question. The voice is female, plural. Our fauna is not the richest and only mermaids and squid can boast of intelligence. There is only one squid. That leaves the mermaids. Yes, said Hermione, and as far as I know, they have a town at the bottom in the middle of the lake. I've even seen a magic photo somewhere. There's a little square and a monument in the center. I think it's a great landmark. But what could be taken? What does each champion have that's so valuable? We're all humans, and humans are different. For one, the most valuable thing might be some concert grand piano, and for another, a quick quotes quill enchanted in person by his long-dead grandfather. Hmm, so it must be something very important, surely irreplaceable. Something that can't just be put in your pocket, so it's pretty big. Something that would make it difficult to get back. At the same time, about the same size and other parameters for everyone. A set of parameters is quite... Hermione unclasped her hands, placing them on the table. Creepy. Human. Exactly. Brilliant, clapped a satisfied Delphine. Excellent conclusions, although it is possible to assume other options. I don't think so. I shook my head. They slipped us dragons. Why not kidnap someone close to us? 
So, Hermione shifted her gaze from me to Lady Greengrass lost. Who gets stolen for whom? It's logical to assume several possibilities. Potter has only one friend within these walls, Ron Weasley. I have you. Along with Fleur came her little sister. Have you seen a girl about 12 years old in a Bobotan's uniform? She, along with the second year, attends classes and is practically a copy of Fleur. I caught a glimpse of her. Is that her sister? Just my guess. That leaves Crumb. Tough question, Miona. He doesn't communicate with anyone at all. I think there will still be a chance for the organizers to find out what they need to know for the task. Kids, Delphine clapped her hands. Enough of the bad stuff. Even assuming your thoughts are correct, there's not a single thing to worry about. After all, for sure, the security of everyone, except the champions, will be at the highest level. Except for the champions, huh? I glanced at Delphine with a smirk, but she only spread her hands. That's what the whole tournament is based on. A lot has been reworked and thought about, but anything can be. The top priority on everyone else's safety. And enough of the bad stuff. Her, Mion, would you please change into your gym clothes? You're gonna have to run today. The girl nodded and went to one of the tent's nooks, and Delphine quickly cast a silencing spell over us. I have good news for you. Have you ever wondered why there was a dress uniform on the shopping list this year? What's there to guess? Sooner or later they'll tell us. There will be a Yule Ball, said Delphine with a sort of pathos, immediately switching to her usual manner. Well, they were supposed to tell you later, about two weeks in advance, but I've decided to do it now. The ball is a month away. Champions are required to open it with their dance partner. I recommend not to wait and invite Hermione. Why her? I was interested in Lady Greengrass's train of thought. Maybe you don't notice, but she's a pretty prominent girl, and just if the judge logically, you communicate only with her. To an outsider, it might seem like she's your only support. If I were in Crumb's shoes, I would certainly try to invite her, and in every possible way to occupy her with my existence, undermining your relationship and leaving you alone. You are a rival and a strong one. They need to take you out of the game even by such simple methods. Why Crumb and not Potter? Young Mr. Potter is not capable of such a move, at least not at the moment. Chapter 206 Hermione, in her blue tracksuit, came out of the fenced-in nook, and we began another practice of transfiguration for speed and accuracy in transforming various objects into other objects while actively moving and dodging. Well, I had to dodge. We decided to go to the Great Hall for dinner. So we changed into our school uniforms and left the hospitable dungeons through the second exit from the Chamber of Secrets. At one of the corners of the castle's empty corridors, a familiar white cat came running out to meet us. I knew it was Delphine having fun, but Hermione didn't. Oh, kitty! Hermione appeared beside the cat in a flash, whose eyes seemed to read, and how could I have forgotten that they were coming here? The resistance was useless and the cat quickly ended up in the girl's arms. Now she went with us to the great hall. I wonder if that's someone's kitty? Hermione gently scratched the cat behind the ear. Maybe I should keep it. Well, try it, I shrugged, chuckling mentally. If she doesn't run away, then she likes that kind of thing. As we approached the great hall, the number of Hogwarts, Bobans, and Durmstrang students loitering back and forth increased. We were all slowly moving toward the tables, since there wasn't much time left before dinner began. Miona, take a seat. I'll be back in a moment. Okay. The girl nodded, taking a seat next to Lavender and Parvati. The girls, of course, paid attention to the cat and immediately began to whisper about something, chuckling. I returned to the hall entrance, and as soon as I saw the twins, I went to intercept them. I have a job for you. Grabbing the guys by the elbows, I quickly led them around the corner. You beat our brother. Two. Again. I don't want to sound like a little kid, but they started it. That's why we have nothing against it. The right twin replied, but both nodded. So what happened? Smuggling? Not today. No, no. I just need two assistants on a simple but important matter. Speak. You do know there's going to be a Yule Ball, right? The twins looked at each other in bewilderment. Oh, well, now you know. Invite a lady, something else. In general, we need to work proactively. In the end, we made a plan. 
According to the twins, if you decide to do something with aplomb, do it the way only you can, and in a way that only makes sense in your performance. So we made a plan, and for most of the evening, the three idiots were running around the forbidden forest, trying to lure and convince the unicorn to take part in the adventure. Unfortunately, the unicorn refused. So they stood there in the already darkening evening woods, a little frozen and annoyed. Well, in short, we have one guy, the right twin spoke. He is always for any activity. And? I asked as we looked around the edge of the forest. Transfiguration. Oh, guys, I shook my head and we headed for the castle. Our plan sounds a little crazy and delirious. Don't worry, young knight champion, the right twin clapped me on the shoulder. Believe the hardened merry fellows and jokers, the second twin repeated the action. Sometimes craziness and delirium, just what you need to get from a lady. A positive response. Upon reaching the house common room, we were immersed in an atmosphere of celebration and merriment. Gryffindor was honoring Potter. Maybe me too, but the twins and I were a little late, and therefore Potter became the main star. There were plenty of snacks and sweets, butterbeer, juices, and even tea for those who especially wanted a similar drink to go with the cake. Open up, open up, the students chanted. Potter stood on a stool in the middle of the common room, staring dazedly and smiling at the guys who surrounded him. Here, he reached to open the egg. Cover your ears, guys, I whispered to the twins, and out of the corner of my eye, I noted Hermione on our couch, who was about to do the same. Remarkably, she had a white cat on her lap covering her eyes. Twins didn't ask any questions, simply covering their ears. Potter opened the egg at that moment, and a horrible high-pitched screech spilled across the common room. It was even a little painful and so unpleasant that almost everyone crouched to the ground, covering their ears. Potter quickly realized to close the egg and stared at it, along with the others, with incomprehension. Good clue, Siemus declared in silence, clearing his ear with his little finger. Despite the strong acoustic attack, everything was back to normal in just a brief moment, and the celebration continued. Okay, where's our photographer? One of the twins looked around as we stepped back a little to the corner. Ah, I see him, Colin. A curly-haired boy, always carrying a camera, turned to us, waved his hand, and quickly ran up. Hi, Fred, George, Max. He smiled cheerfully. Can I take a picture of you? For a memory. Sure, grinned one of the twins and they put their hands on my shoulders without talking, posing for a photo. More pathos, I said, taking a handkerchief from my pocket and transfiguring it into a big two-handed claymore, simple but pretty. Resting the point on the floor, I put my hands on the grip. It was at chest level. Oh, rejoiced Colin, immediately taking a couple of pictures. Cool, I want to do that too. Learn transfiguration, canceled the spell, tucking the handkerchief into my pocket. We have a case for you, one of the twins took over the conversation. We need a volunteer for a little performance with Transfiguration. Um, okay, nodded Colin cheerfully. A galleon for participation and five if you need to transfigure me, but only in the proven way. Certainly proven, Colin. Who do you take us for? Left twin pretended to be offended. The Weasley twins, I guess, Colin nodded, making the boys laugh. After the guy agreed, the twins moved on to discuss the details of the plan and the components available. So, do we have potions for stabilizing consciousness in a transfigured form? We do. The spell for the right transfiguration? Check. House elves for support? I'll arrange it tonight. So, oh, Max, do you need something? No, I'll get it myself. Fine, let's get to work then. Guys, why did you agree so easily with such a crazy idea? Because it's crazy? Also, it's an occasion to promote some of our products and invite the girls along the way. Everything's clear with you. How did you end up in Gryffindor? Enterprising like Slytherins. Not from a good life, our friend Knight. Chapter 207 The morning after the first task of the tournament was, as is customary in England and Scotland, overcast and cold as November. There was no snow yet, but hoarfrost covered almost everything it could, and Black Lake, as the awakened students noticed, again lived up to its name, bringing a gloomy mood with its dark water surface. The awakened students dragged their feet lazily to the Great Hall for breakfast, and the Gryffindors were the most lethargic of them all, because a party doesn't go away without a trace. Except for the first-year students, 
who were responsibly sent to sleep in their rooms, they looked vigorous. When the students were more or less assembled at their desks and beginning to finally wake up, lazily picking at their breakfast with the cutlery, Hermione noticed something amiss. No, there was nothing unusual about Max's absence. He often either ate in the kitchen or called Timmy so he wouldn't have to walk back and forth. However, the absence of the Weasley twins, with whom Max had discussed something for a long time yesterday and with enthusiasm, raised concerns. It's scary to imagine what this trio can do with Max's capabilities and the twins' imagination. Some swarming near the open doorframe of the Great Hall caught Hermione's attention, and when the second opened, the girl knew. Here they are, troubles. Two house elves, in spotless, perfectly fitting pillowcases with Hogwarts coats of arms, carried a huge painting into the hall and stood at the entrance. A famous gossip, and to put it mildly, a silly joker, Sir Cadogan, was looking at everyone from the picture. A third house elf ran briskly out a little ahead and comically banged his big staff on the floor. The champion of Hogwarts, Maximilian Knight, on a white horse, sir, with an escort, the house elf gave out loudly and then in a whisper. The great wizard, sir. Oh. In the silence, the last words were clearly audible. At exactly the same moment, the twins in black suits and robes with scarlet lining and decorations flew into the hall on brooms very slowly. They led the brooms horizontally, literally standing on makeshift foot pegs, and a thick white mist oozed from the bars on the brooms, quickly flowing across the floor. Illusory birds were constantly flying out of the twins' hands, but an attentive wizard would have noticed that each such bird came from a small ball that turned into such a bird. The twins deftly pulled them out of their sleeves. The twins were followed by Max Knight, who rode into the hall on a real white horse in a dense blue Patronus fog, which was comical. The effect of the Patronus was good, and everyone present woke up with good memories and feelings, completely leveling the absurdity of what was happening. Even the fact that Max himself was in a completely black suit and robe did not confuse anyone. As soon as Max rode his horse into the hall, the illusory birds, already flying in large numbers under the ceiling, played solemn music loud and clear. Hermione, as well as the girls sitting next to her, caught the direction of Max's gaze, and this made her even more worried about the upcoming events. He was moving along the tables just towards her, and everyone was watching, and the professors, and with such interest, even the white cat, who was happily sitting next to Hermione and pulled bits of bacon from the common plate, stopped chewing them and stared at what was happening with wide-open blue eyes. The whole procession of twins, Horse and Max, quickly made their way to where Hermione was sitting, and Max deftly jumped to the floor, right in front of the shocked girl. As soon as the Christmas holidays, in the tradition of the Triwizard Tournament, there will be a Yule Ball, as Max spoke, the music from the illusory birds almost faded. Hermione Jean Granger, will you go to the ball with me? The girl blinked a couple of times, and the white cat hit her hand with its paw. Ah, yes, I'll go. Yay, the twins shouted immediately, and with a wave of their hand, they turned all the birds into F. Iraworks, the sparks of which, falling to the floor, turned into rose petals. The Patronus effect and the fireworks put the students in a good festive mood. They all started to applaud and congratulate everyone on the spot plunging the hall into some incomprehensible bacchanalia of general joy and happiness. Branded charms for a broom, meanwhile, one of the twins shouted, demonstratively changing the colors of the fog, sometimes turning the fog itself into sparks. On sale only with us. Fireworks, explosive birds, a unique offer, advertised the second twin, handing out colorful sample balloons, unique decorations for the ball, other items were already being advertised by the first twin. The girls who sat next to Hermione squealed happily, looking at her classmate with mild envy, but Hermione was tormented by other questions. Although the fact of the invitation, the ball, and other things, at least it became clear why the lists for this year included a parade uniform for boys or a dress for girls. Chapter 208 Why in black? Where did you find the horse? The slightly blushing girl immediately asked Max. This is my faithful Bucephalus, on which we will ride off into the sunset after the ball toward happiness and adventures. The noise in the hall didn't stop, 
but judging by the movement at the house table, Dumbledore was about to calm everyone down, and McGonagall was already rapidly picking up speed, moving toward the epicenter of the outrage. Why not a unicorn? hid her embarrassment behind an ironic smile, Hermione. We tried, but they didn't agree. At that moment, the figure of the horse began to turn into Colin Creevy. No sunsets, resented the curly-haired fellow. Bucephalus wants to eat. You turned a third-year student into a horse? No, really? Yes, he was only glad about it. Dennis, yelled Colin toward the door to the hall, but the answer came from the side. Yeah? Came out of invisibility, Colin's younger brother with a camera in his hands. All filmed, a lot and cool. Well done. Colin held out his palm and his brother high-fived. What a grand collusion. Hermione smiled after all and pulled Max by the sleeve of his suit to the table. Stop the mess! Professor McGonagall spoke sternly and loudly, and Dumbledore at that moment, with a slight movement of his hand, put a silencio on the entire hall, and silence reigned immediately. An unprecedented violation of the rules, reprimanded McGonagall to our entire company. The twins with brooms in their hands were already standing side by side, elbowing each other cheerfully and winking, and they were communicating just fine without words. For such a glaring and blatant breach of discipline, I hereby deprive each of you of ten points. Contrary to what the professor said, this did not upset anyone in our company. However, I have to admit that in my memory, this is the most extraordinary and for the most part completely unnecessary invitation to the ball. For your work and demonstration of extraordinary skills in transfiguration, enchantment, and potions, I assign twenty points to each of you. The twins and the Creevy brothers rejoiced as if in a silent movie, but the headmaster's silencio did not allow a single sound to leak out. So, Dumbledore spoke when more or less everyone had calmed down and he had removed the spell from the hall. Since we have all witnessed such an extraordinary act, I am announcing, albeit somewhat ahead of schedule, a Yule Ball. It will be held on the second day of the vacation, and students from the fourth year will be allowed to attend. You may, of course, invite younger students as well. Your heads of house, professors, and headmasters will tell you the rest of the organizational details. The headmaster sat back down at his desk, and we all continued on with breakfast. Someone wanted to be indignant, saying, like Lockhart spoiled all the food with their trash. Are you a wizard or what? One of the twins shouted to the disgruntled and snapped his fingers demonstratively. All the petals disappeared, causing general amazement. However, Flitwick and some other professors and students saw the point of this action. It was part of the charms program. For as long as I can remember in this life, I have never before experienced such a forgotten feeling of mild shame. No, of course, I had participated in the creation of this idea, but it was the twins who had contributed most of the nonsense. And they can't complain, they were quite good at advertising everything, and for what reason? The ball. I felt a little uncomfortable at breakfast, and Hermione was looking at me strangely. Although, the Delphine, in the form of a cat, looked at me much more strangely. Why hadn't she run away from the girl in the first place? That's what boredom can do to wizards. She would have been better off keeping an eye on Daphne, quietly flirting with Knot. Though maybe it should be so, who will understand them in this English swamp? Max, Seamus sat down next to me. Wah, wow, hey, didn't you tell anyone about the ball? I just found out about it yesterday. And you got everything ready so quickly? A bit unnecessary, it seems to me. And he, in general... Hermione spoke up, setting the cutlery aside on an empty plate. Either nothing, or like this, from extreme to extreme. Would it be better if I just invited you? Well, you could somehow be more modest. Hermione looked around the hall quickly. Everyone's looking at me now. Now they will not give me peace. Well, even if I invited you quietly, they wouldn't give you any peace after the ball. A whole month of quiet life has fallen into the abyss. Hermione paused. But I'm glad— this is definitely better than the just-like-that invitation. Mew. What, kitty? Here's some more bacon for you. The cat pounced on the bacon under the gaze of the smiling girl. And why is she so obsessed with bacon? How about some fish? And I look at this and wonder what will happen when Hermione finds out about this cat's identity. And she will sooner or later. I'm sure it will be one of my funniest memories. Chapter 209 
After breakfast, we went safely to our own activities, me to the Chamber of Secrets, Hermione to her lessons. When I got to the dungeons and entered the tent, I found Delphine there in her customary pantsuit. That was entertaining, she smiled, sitting down at her desk. As I understand it, you seem to have decided exactly how the second task will be conducted. How do you plan to handle it? There was a thought of creating a port key. I sat down in my seat across from Lady Greengrass. It won't help. Even if you're right, don't you think the hypothetical kidnapped person would be searched? There are, of course, extreme ways to hide things, but I don't think it's even worth suggesting to a girl. And I don't think it's a good idea for a guy, either. Hmm. Is there any possibility that it will be at the ball that the target is finally determined? There's always a possibility, no matter what event you're considering. I understand you want to keep the girl safe, but is it necessary? At such a question, I only raised an eyebrow inquiringly. Judge for yourself. She is a very capable girl. At this point, she could have been champion herself. And had she thrown her name into the cup instead of you, I'm sure Hermione would have been in the tournament. She's capable of securing her own. But even taking your theory about the second task as true, do you really doubt yourself so much? Do you think you can't get her out of the bottom of the lake? I don't doubt myself. I just don't want to put her in danger. You won't get anything by being overprotective, but you'll get a lot by trusting. Speaking of the lake and theories, have you figured out how not to breathe underwater for an hour, I hope? Bubblehead charm, partial or full transfiguration, gillyweed, hmm. By the way, teacher, is there any battle transgression underwater? Do you know how to perform that transfiguration trick? No, but you can teach it, right? Delphine smiled. I will. Anyway, someone who positions himself as a battle mage needs to know this. In fact, I've planned such training, but let's start with the apparition. I already know how. And why didn't I doubt it, but I need to check it out. Let's go. Delphine got up from the table, picked up one of the bags in the corner of the tent hall, and went outside. So I followed her. Look, Lady Greengrass said, taking a small hoop out of the bag and enlarging it to the size of a hula hoop, placing it on the stone floor of the Chamber of Secrets. You stand in this circle. Delphine walked a dozen yards and pulled out another hoop. After doing the same manipulation with it, she swiped her wand next to the circle. Apparate into that circle. Without further ado, I visualized the spot, released my magic, and spun around, finding myself inside the circle. I see. Clearly and smoothly, Delphine nodded, heading toward the first circle. But Hogwarts doesn't allow apparition. Through those circles, you can, but they have to be in direct line of sight of each other and no further than 15 meters. They were specially created in the Ministry a hundred years ago to conduct the apparition training in the seventh year without having to remove and re-raise Hogwarts defenses. I see. How will I learn battle transgression? First theory, then practice, nothing new. I was given two hours of theory, and it wasn't a textbook, but visual examples of the partial transfiguration of different objects. It turns out that transgression is one of the most complex transfiguration disciplines. It studies not just the transfiguration of matter, but the transfiguration of space and dimensions, not those dimensions that are parallel. For clarity, Delphine showed battle transgression, and unlike apparition, it is allowed at Hogwarts because there was no such technique in the Founder's time. When it appeared about 60 years ago, the Ministry and the Governors did not give the money for a comprehensive defense upgrade. They, by the way, already finance Hogwarts, basically just pay in salaries, maintaining a minimum supply, and by antiquated laws paying tuition for certain categories of students. That's it. All the rest of the money Dumbledore looks for himself, and a lot of it is produced within the castle walls. But that's not what we're talking about now. Delphine may be a master of transfiguration, but such a trick as transgression requires a wand in hand. Anyway, Lady Greengrass twisted her wand around its axis, and the woman's entire figure seemed to sink in heavy black smoke. Inside this smoke, dark vertical lines slid from time to time, like in sci-fi movies with teleportation. Out of the smoke appeared, now and then, for a brief moment, a face, an arm, or half a torso at once. Go around. Delphine's voice echoed somehow from over the edge. 
I walked around the smoking figure, and what surprised me was that no matter which side I looked from, I always saw the full face of Delphine, and she was always looking at me. It's hard to explain, Lady Greengrass continued in a hushed voice, but in reality, I am only present in two dimensions and time. Though from the outside, it may seem that the smoke has a volume. And how do you see? Delphine rose into the air and began to fly around in black smoke, leaving a plume. If you looked closely, this smoke was indeed wrong, but what exactly was wrong was unclear. All at once, completely circular vision, she said. At the same time, I can still conjure with or without my wand. For a brief moment, a hand with a wand appeared out of the smoke, and on reflex, I pulled mine out and held out Protigo Totalum. The stupefy beam struck the shield, shattering helplessly. You notice something? For a moment, it seemed as if the hand with the wand had become material. It did. The smoke flew close to me, and now I could see Delphine's face much more clearly. It did seem flat, had, but not like a picture. Each eye saw a different plane, creating a strange illusion of deformation. For witchcraft with a wand, you have to materialize your hand and wand in reality. But without the wand, the black smoke sent a slight shockwave, pushing me half a meter away. After standing up, I looked at the smoke again. It's possible to stay in this state without a wand. Pros, material attacks have no effect, and non-material attacks only very strong. Avada hits the target, I tell you right away. But everything that has to do with the effect on the matter does not. Curses that have an abstract notion of harm rather than a concrete one, like Reducto, work great. Delphine cancelled the spell and appeared in her quite familiar form. Chapter 210 I spent the day learning formulas, processing them with Rowena's help, learning wand movement, and analyzing the magical structure that results in the process. It's interesting that the action starts like the apparition. You have to envelop yourself in your magic. The second step is to create the structure within the resulting cocoon, and only then does the spell work. This transfiguration does not apply to free, and it is very important to know the formula precisely. No one knows how the process of structuring magic by formula works, but it works. I'm sure it's the same thing as in ordinary science. They fit the phenomenon to the numbers. We ordered lunch from the house elves in the room at the second exit of the dungeons, and afterward we continued our studies again. There were problems, yes. There were serious problems. The completely spherical vision was incredibly disorienting. You couldn't see up or down. There's no point of focus for the vision to direct the movement. It takes some getting used to, and a lot of practice. When Hermione came in the evening and started asking Delphine about the ball, I kept practicing. Of course, the girl was interested in such interesting magic, not described in books. She received a detailed answer and, of course, wished to learn the same, but was rejected, though only today. It is necessary to learn how to apparate, and the results will be the conclusion. Then, what are we going to do today? inquired Hermione reasonably. You will learn to dance. Pleased with her idea, Delphine pulled out a gramophone from a nook in the tent. I love gramophone, she shrugged in response to our surprised looks. The atmosphere in the tent visibly brightened as the device appeared on Delphine's desk. With a gesture of her wand, she pushed all the other furniture into the corner, freeing up the center of the room, and we stood there as if waiting for an execution. What's wrong with you two? So beating each other with magic and physical training to the point of exhaustion is no problem, and when it's time to dance, you two look like pieces of furniture? Hermione at least has some interest in her eyes. But you? The apprentice. You knew that you would have to dance, inviting a girl. In my head, I had pictures of my past life where I tried to dance, free dance, so to speak. That's terrible. My achievements in this field can be compared with one well-known character in a computer game bearing the popular surname Shepard. Delphine pulled out a trunk of records from somewhere and began going through them. No, not that one. Oh, a good record, but the wrong one. Ah, here! Finding the right one, Lady Greengrass fiddled with the record player for a couple of moments, and lo and behold, a waltz tune played from the horn in very good quality, but not without those iron notes, giving the sound a distinctive touch. Why are we standing? There's nothing special at the ball in terms of dancing. They open with a waltz, 
That's what you'll have to demonstrate flawlessly, and a couple of simplified dances too. Hermione and I looked at each other. Do you know how to dance? A little, Hermione nodded. Then we'll learn. Fine, nodded Delphine. So, Max, take Hermione's right hand with your left. Well done. Pull it out a little to the side. Great. It was amusing to watch the girl's embarrassment break through the occlumency, with her lips twitching in an attempt not to smile. Hermione, put your left hand on Max's shoulder, elbow slightly raised. Max, right hand on the girl's back. Great. Now I'm going to conjure a movement pattern on the floor. Arrows and foot patterns appeared beneath our feet. You could have been taught by the square, but I prefer practice in this matter, and for simplicity. Delphine created a faceless, ghostly illusion of a man and a woman with a flick of her wand. Watch, repeat, the rhythm is in the music. Let's go. One, two, three, one, two, three. It was unusual and long forgotten. Even in a previous life, I had taken some time to learn the basics, but back then, I didn't feel even a shadow of embarrassment holding my partner's hand, being this close, looking eye to eye. Depending on the dance, holding my hand on her back or her waist, it's both fun and exhilarating. Even learning the basics creates a wonderful sense of intimacy, but somehow, insufficient. I want more. At the same time, if you embrace at all and move sluggishly in a so-called slow dance, not even a tenth of these feelings arise. Oh my God, I remember someone saying, Dancing is a clumsy substitute for sex. There is definitely something in that phrase, and in the dancing itself. Not so much, of course. But yes, damn, even in my thoughts appeared stuttering while learning the waltz in its perfect performance. And there are many other variations, with the hand not on the partner's back but on the waist. Of course, this is not tango with its expression, but also quite entertaining. But how to do it all for another month, I do not know.